We have long postulated that the Great Pyramids exhibit several more modern conservations now still draped upon them in various areas and in various states of erosion. These attempts, although now also ruins, are evidently much younger in age, their stark lacking of weathering, and the enormous exoskeleton of the original structure within now exposed in such areas as the West Wing. If one wanted to get a true snapshot of the actual astonishing age of these remarkable structures, one would think to dive into the deepest depths of its foundation, the subterranean chamber. The first thing noticed when venturing into these underground caverns, once carved into this enormous plateau built to hold these massive million-ton structures, is its unfinished appearance. How could this be? Why would the presumably earliest sector of the Great Pyramid itself appear to have been either finished hastily or abruptly abandoned? It is commonly argued within academic circles that this chamber was built prior to a quote, change of plan, with the upper layers later adapted into tombs. This hypothesis, as always, made within the parameters of currently understood paradigms and does not take into account the evidence we have been presenting for over 10 years. We, on the other hand, have a more compelling theory. Within this subterranean chamber are recorded attempts to dig out more of the foundation's floor, this undertaken in the 1800s by Cavigula, by another 30 feet. Additionally, on the southern side, there lay an ancient tunnel dug to a depth of 16 meters, yet leads to nowhere, also abandoned. With the previously mentioned evidence of later attempts to conserve these ruins, there has also been a litany of offenses against these priceless ruins over the ages, such as what we now feel is the subterranean chamber itself, not built with care and planning, but rather an incredibly ancient attempt to dig into and beneath these structures with what we now believe was possibly in an attempt to rob them as no funerary arrangements were ever incorporated into the build and the lack of care, along with the attempted tunnel, possibly a boring attempt made at the same time, along with Caligula, is also, we feel, more suggestive of our hypothesis. Khufu's sarcophagus, indeed the king's chamber itself, although the lid is missing from the casket, and indeed this in itself a mystery, the sarcophagus is noticeably too small. Who or what were these structures built for? We have the casing stones, white in nature, that, according to significant study, did indeed once drape the Great Pyramid itself, singing statues in Memnon. Where did these stones, or indeed the capstone, go? Why are there several different clear stages of construction upon the outer, less weighty stones, some of a polygonal nature? if these structures were not inhabited by several now-lost civilizations in succession. We hope you find our continued discoveries highly compelling. It is one thing to create a gargantuan pile of blocks, one painstakingly hammered from the sandstone bedrock, dragged into form with utilization of rolling stones and timber sleds, creating a structure reminiscent of a pyramid, using blocks that we would puzzle over for centuries. To build a million-ton structure, however, one with once hermetically sealed star shafts, tunnels, claimed tombs, and a grand gallery that was said to have been as smooth as glass, with an exoskeleton now discovered to have been made with stones many hundreds, often thousands of tons in weight, to have somehow perfectly placed these atop one another is something else entirely. To create this structure today would cost an unimaginable amount of money would take decades to plan, and would probably turn out at nowhere near the same levels of accuracy or weight of stones. How is one question. But we feel a more interesting question is why. They were not tombs, and there is unquestionably undiscovered knowledge hidden within these mysterious chambers. And the granite plugs are of no exception, a little-known puzzle which Egyptologists and historians alike have argued over their function and indeed purpose of being for years. Some believe the creators of the pyramid built them into the pyramid itself, and others, who believe they were later installed, possibly by another lost civilization, who may have themselves once deciphered the mysteries of the pyramids. The most compelling theory are that these are, in fact, plugging hidden entrances, 
ones once entered and for some reason covered back up, could there be something of incredible importance hidden beyond these granite plugs? The Edgar brothers claim to have found an ancient form of plaster around one of the plug's edges, hinting at this indeed being the case. Extract from Petri, quote, The present top one is not the original end. It is roughly broken, and there is a bit of granite still cemented to the floor some way further south of it. The broken end of the upper block and a chip of granite still remaining cemented to the floor of the passage a little above that, showing that it was probably 24 inches longer than it is now. Thus, the total length of plug blocks would have been about 10 cubits. Extract from the Edgar Brothers, Volume 2, quote, The granite plug is composed of three blocks of red granite. There is a space of a few inches between the lowermost and middle blocks. Petri says four inches. The top end of the uppermost block is much fractured in appearance. Professor Petri says he saw a bit of granite still cemented to the floor two feet further up the passage. We, also, saw what for some time we took to be a piece of granite at the place indicated. But on more careful examination, it proved to be a lump of coarse red plaster. We saw several similar pieces of plaster adhering to the angles of the floor and walls throughout the length of the passage. We also saw at least one such piece of plaster in the Grand Gallery. We believe that the upper end of the granite plug is in its original state, and that its rough, unfinished appearance has symbolic significance. The upper end of the lowermost block also has a fractured appearance, which is certainly original, for the stone is very inaccessible and there is no room for anyone to work at it." End quote. What do you think are the purpose of the granite plugs? We will keep you posted. Arce, the American Research Center in Egypt. Arce's website states as follows. Among Arce's many great achievements is our relationship with the Supreme Council of Antiquities, the SCA, within the Egyptian Ministry of Culture, without whom our work would not be possible. Arce is viewed as making important contributions that serve to help Egypt directly in its pursuit of cultural heritage preservation. What this statement confesses to is the implication and more than likely collaboration with Egyptian authorities to cover up the real truth about ancient Egypt. In 1992, German robotics engineer Rudolf Gantenbrecht was exploring shafts within the Queen's Chamber at the Great Pyramid, using a crawler robot he had designed himself. His intentions were to install an air conditioning system within the pyramid's existing design. While exploring these ancient tunnels, he discovered one of the shafts was blocked by a tiny limestone blocking door, a secret doorway only accessible with the use of robotic technology. Rudolf Gantenbrick, who was able to map, explore, and analyze the shafts for many years, believed a second door would have suggested the possibility that there would be yet another 40 centimeters further away. His hypothesis, based on the knowledge that many ancient Egyptian funerary monuments were equipped with a series of three blocking doors placed close to each other in succession before the entrance to a sacred tomb. In 2002, the National Geographic Society discovered this second door. Using their own robot known as Pyramid Rover, this event, closely supervised by Arce, who subsequently pulled the plug on the whole operation regarding the shafts. The team had a simple solution to Gantenbrick's problem. They sent the robot along the shaft, gripping the walls instead of the ceiling and floor. In this manner, it was somehow able to ride over the top of the obstacles. The rover's journey along the northern shaft revealed yet another door, just as Gantenbrick's claimed. Mysterious hieroglyphs, written on the floor of the hidden tunnels within Egypt's Great Pyramid, were shown to the world in an initial report on the robot's discoveries published within the Due Service Day Antiquities. The images revealed features that had not been seen by human eyes since the construction of the monument. Researchers from around the world were particularly intrigued by three red ochre figures painted upon the tunnel's end deep inside the pyramid. Books such as Giza the Truth by Chris Harold and Ian Lawton, The Stargate Conspiracy by Lynn Picknett and Clive Prince, and Secret Chamber by Robert Balville have all, thanks to the tremendous and diligent research accomplished within, shed light upon the controversy surrounding the Giza Plateau and the Secret Chamber's existence.
The key question, the theme witnessed throughout these studies, was whether information has been withheld, discoveries undisclosed, and an understanding of the pyramids and sphinx existence purposefully kept hidden from the world. On the 22nd of March, 1993, Dr. Zawi Hawass was suspended from his position as chief inspector of the Giza Pyramid Plateau. It seems Gantenbrick took an opportunity, while the powers that be were distracted, to announce his findings to the world press in early April. It would appear, after substantial digging, that the string pullers within Egypt originate out of America and are stationed within Egypt in the form of Arsi. The truth regarding what is buried beneath these ancient structures may still remain a mystery, but realizing the obstacles obstructing an understanding of this truth is half the battle won. False doors are undoubtedly one of the most perplexing mysteries of the ancient world. Found all over the globe, legends regarding these enigmatic doorways, seemingly leading nowhere, actually, once having been active portals of unknown origins, have permeated the many native cultures still found at many of these ancient anomalies. The toppled obelisk of Axum, for example, is not only one of the largest megaliths found on Earth, weighing many thousands of tons, once cut, transported, and subsequently erected within an obelisk field in Ethiopia, is drenched in false doorways. Found in peculiar locations within Peru's mountain ranges, one in particular found within a unique location within a rock face containing a rare element now used to increase radio frequencies. Yet the most intriguing and well-known of these doorways is the Gateway to the Gods, also known as the Midas Monument. Once perfectly carved into one face of a slim outcrop within this ancient site, literally translated as inscribed rock within the Eskashahir province in Turkey. Predictably, any circumstantial evidence that would suggest a date of creation within new or known world history have taken place by the academics tasked with dating the monument and the surrounding relics. The crude inscriptions, which we feel, due to the difference in quality and ability of their creators, we believe dated at a more primitive time, have been used to age the monument to no earlier than the 6th century BC. This inscription, translated as, Attis has dedicated this monument to Midas, Lavactus, and Vanex, being used to date the entire site. Quote, the name Attis, a variant of Attis, is a prominent name in Phrygia associated with royalty. The fact that the dedication is made to Midas may indicate that he had received posthumous ruler cult. Various indications place the date of the monument's construction in the early to mid-7th century BC. The inscription probably indicates that the monument was erected after the death of Midas in the early 7th century BC. Another inscription on the right side of the monument includes the letter Yod, which was added to the Phrygian alphabet in the mid-6th century BC. End quote. No consideration has apparently been given to the possibility that, like many other as yet unexplained ruins we have shared, may have simply been re-inhabited and subsequently claimed as this people's work, giving a false perception of abilities and power. We find this curious. Who built the Midas monument? Could these false doors have actually once been portals to another place? We find such hypothesis, and indeed the monument itself, highly compelling. Who built the Great Pyramids? Why did they build them? If we take known Egyptian accounts as accurate, then many of the ancient structures upon the plateau were designed surrounding the subject of death. A civilization that believed when the sun set, it traveled through an underworld guarded by Anubis. In other cultures, which we believe re-inhabited sites, ruins built with knowledge that we will now show far succeeded that which these people, who carved their own identities upon these structures, ever possessed. The Aztecs, although displaying similar primitive understandings of the path of the sun, interestingly shared similar beliefs to the Egyptians. Specific animals connected to astronomical objects are seen everywhere. These similarities in belief structures could be seen as evidence of a seagoing civilization. 
Ancient peoples crossing oceans, sharing their belief systems with each other. These people who artistically demonstrated their limited and heavily superstitious knowledge of the universe upon all these ancient sites sealed their own fate as impostors to the modern discerning man. Once one begins to explore the unbelievable accuracy, the astronomical alignments, the seemingly impossible feats of block placements, you are seemingly presented with a controversial truth. How could a civilization who clearly believed that the Earth was not only flat, but that all experienced night at the same time could have possibly known the information which was instilled within the construction of such sites, in particular the Giza Plateau. It should now be becoming clear that the ancient Egyptians, the Incas, Aztecs, Mayans, etc., etc., did not build these sites. However, the sites still exist, and their past function is still there to be explained. Why did so many of these civilizations, placed far closer to these original constructors than us, all agree that these structures were some sort of portal, allowing the passage of gods, spirits, or souls? Why were all these ancient civilizations, who undoubtedly worshipped the original creators of the cradle for their people, obsess over underworlds, portals, and stargates? Most ancient civilizations had belief systems surrounding death, the soul, and the passage thereof. But the strong draw to portals and gateways, somehow allowing the communication with an apparent other dimension, is undeniable. It seems so strongly entwined with these ancient people's beliefs, that these civilizations may have been aware of something regarding these amazing structures that we are not. False doors, for example. These doors to nowhere can be found all over Earth, yet interestingly, they are only found amongst the same uncannily astonishing stone cutting which we are so often noting as indicative of a lost knowledge. Why were these doors created? Have they always led to nowhere? Or was there something extraordinary, once triggered by this precise web of ancient structures, all mysteriously aligned upon our planet? A function so many of these ancient civilizations were completely obsessed by. We recently covered the enigmatic megalith, known as the White Rock of Vilcambaba within Peru, showing how this rock was in fact abandoned, abandoned midway through being harvested of blocks to be used in the nearby polygonal masonry, with many other sites, many still strewn with blocks cut with a natural appearing face, but a right-angled interlocking body. Yet upon the white rock still remained other mysterious patterns, such as that of the 90-degree steps cut into the stone. We have identified this kind of stone cutting previously, such as at Machu Picchu, clearly used to help construct the polygonal walls themselves, but also at other, until now unexplained, unfinished stones many found throughout Peru. Naupa Iglesia, for example found just outside the astonishing ancient ruins of Olente Tambo, a mysterious megalith that many, including us, previously presumed was possibly some elaborate deliberate carving, a throne, or possibly, like the false door, meters away, an ancient portal of some form. However, when one approaches said rock with the same eye as that of the white rock, one quickly finds matching stonework finished and installed as that of the water fountain found within Olente Tambo itself, thus further supporting our hypothesis of these types of stone cuts and indeed step patterning found upon them is indicative of unfinished, abruptly abandoned stonework, many left unliberated or strewn among their ancient quarries. As with the many other discoveries made, once one begins to perceive unexplained artifacts of this nature in the correct way they suddenly make sense, and the supportive evidence simply flows from the hidden into plain sight. How this, or possibly another clearly advanced yet once Stone Age civilization, made the cut marks into the solid pink Aswan granite found upon the unfinished obelisk among many other megalithic blocks found within the Aswan quarry within Egypt, however, is yet another mystery yet to be unraveled. 
but by identifying and distinguishing between what were enormous megalithic block quarries and what were those of the baffling polygonal blocks is, we believe, the correct path to take if one wishes to unravel the mystery of just how this lost civilization operated, what they were constructing, and hopefully explain who they were and indeed where we came from. It is a pursuit which we find highly compelling. In the past, whenever an artifact or ancient ruin was to rear its unexplainable head, funded parties would scramble to quickly rebury them within museum archives or to simply ignore and not publicly share such discoveries. As such, many of the sites that we cover here upon our channel are not only notoriously difficult to track down and study, but are also very often unfamiliar to our many viewers. One continues their way through the same journey as you and I, by perusing the many subjects we have already covered. The feelings of confusion as having never been confronted with said locations and data therein actually becomes a sense of predictability and a symptom of a much larger conspiracy. As we push on with more and more sites and artifacts, further compounding the proof of this cover-up and deepening our evidential arsenal regarding this ignored and in some cases suppressed history upon our planet, it is inevitable that sooner or later the movement will indeed begin to move. And this is our mission. The Inga Stone, located in the middle of the Inga River in Paraiba State, northeast of Brazil, an artifact like any other which has an unexplained and possibly controversial history is little known to the world. It is a rock formation which covers an area of approximately 250 meters squared. However, upon this enormous rock is an unknown language with quite possibly an untold story. 46 meters long and 3.8 meters high, there are etchings made all over this stone whose meanings, although extensively studied by some of the best minds on the planet, remain unknown and undeciphered. Several figures are carved in low relief, illustrations of animals, fruits, and human constellations like Orion and our very own Milky Way can be seen. Scholars presume that it was created by natives that lived in the area until the 18th century, although any compelling evidence to support this claim has yet to surface. Thought to depict animals, fruits, weapons, humans, possible ancient aircrafts or birds, and what appears to be a table of contents, with stories divided into sections with each symbol connected to the number of a chapter, what it says is not known. Ignatius Rolum, professor of Greek and Latin theology, argued the symbols were similar to ancient Phoenician carvings, while others felt the symbols were related to ancient ruins. An additional popular hypothesis is, of course, ancient aliens, since the Inga's symbols were so different to any others found. Some researchers, such as Claudio Quintans of the Parabeno Center of Ufology, has postulated that a spaceship landed in the Inga area during this ancient time, and the symbols were probably drawn by these extraterrestrial guests. An incredible stone, with a history we may one day unravel. Has ancient alien technology finally been discovered within Russia? According to several talented UFO enthusiasts, along with a number of scientists, that is exactly what has happened. A team from Princeton University in America and the University of Florence in Italy have discovered a quote, quasi-crystal, so named because of its unorthodox arrangement of atoms, found within a meteorite from a remote region of northeastern Russia. This crystal, long thought impossible to be formed naturally due to being too energetically unstable and atomically manipulated. When the team discovered that the meteorite contained this mysterious, ancient, intelligently designed material, they merely moved the goalposts, simply stating that it can indeed be formed naturally. Technically, scientists describe quasi-crystals as quasi-periodic, being manually ordered, no longer found on the periodic table. Although they exhibit a pattern that fills all available mass continuously, they lack what scientists and mathematicians term translational symmetry. Simply put, they are not naturally occurring materials. 
The meteorite in which it was found is believed to be around 4.5 billion years old. Yet alas, when it picked up this perplexing and possibly alien passenger may remain unknown. UFO enthusiasts and scientists alike have previously hypothesized that evidence for alien life would, in all possibility, be found in a form such as this. Pointing out that quasi-crystals, being a novel form of matter, should actually be seen as artifacts of alien artificially created technology. No one has ever been able to explain how quasi-crystals can be formed by natural processes, and no one is ever likely to. It just does not happen. Their forbidden symmetry, making them impossible to be formed naturally. The only other known quasi-crystals, besides those found in the Chukotka meteorites, were only recently synthesized within laboratory conditions by scientists. Being very hard, with low friction characteristics, also a low heat conduction, quasi-crystals are a very useful product, used in a wide range of high-speed technologies, such as the coatings of airplanes and stealth fighters. Two-time Nobel Prize winner Linus Pauling, the idol of the American Chemical Society and one of the most famous scientists in the world, argued till his last days against quasi-periosity in Crystal's mere existence. He didn't even believe we would ever manage to create it. Does this sound like a naturally occurring material to you? How did this complex material end up on and within an ancient meteorite? Did this lump of space debris once collide with an alien craft, somewhere out there in deep space? It seems, regardless of what certain scientific bodies would have you presume, that is indeed the most likely scenario.